I wasn't aware of it, but I was uh, always coming or moving towards architecture. And you know that uh, the old cliche about your journey or our journey, uh, our journeys. Um, looking back, um, all of the experiences of my youth and growing up that I thought were so terrible turned out to be invaluable for, <laughs> for <laughs> architects. So I grew up in the Midwest in a steel town uh, called Gary near Chicago on Lake Michigan. Hmm. And my grandfather worked at U.S. Steel, and I was watching them pour uh, molten ingots of steel when I was probably seven or eight. Uh, so I would go to work with them once in a while and see that. And my father worked for a fastener company in Gary. So it was very kind of um, conservative mid Midwestern upbringing, mm -hmm. um, a lot of work. We, uh, not a wealthy family, we grew up growing our own gardens and fixing our own stuff, maintaining our house. So things that I hated on a hot sum summer day, redoing the roof with my dad, uh, turned out later that, you know, you have a basis for understanding how water flows on a roof. And so uh, pretty hands-on um, upbringing. And, and then my father kind of pushed me into en engineering and I went to Purdue and I worked in uh, aircraft for four years, I think, for Cessna in Wichita, Kansas, uh, on the wing group of the Citation Three. Well, you uh, might have to unpack some of that there, because I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> I was going to say, if you're an airplane, <laughs> you know what that means, but um, they were doing one of the first kind of intercontinental business jets called the Citation Three, hmm. and um, I worked on the wing group, so we drew um, with rapidographs. I don't know if you guys know what those are. You're pretty uh, yeah, yeah, young. Yeah. <laughs> Ink on mylar. Um, <laughs> before uh, computer drafting, right? Um, but then I, um, my first wife's father was an architect and I, I met him and toured his office in Las Vegas and he had a pretty big office and I was probably 21 at the time, 22 and working at Lear in um, Stead, Nevada. His last project was a all graphite airplane, which was amazing and why I came west and to, to Nevada. Mm -hmm we were blowing up fuselages made out of graphite epoxy back in the late 70s before graphite epoxy really was known very well, right? Uh, but I met David. David Wells um, was the architect's name, and he had a large firm. He was doing university buildings at UNLV campus. And uh, there was this one kind of, I think of it as a magic day, but uh, uh, he took me to the office and I toured the office and, uh, you know, the front of the office was, was pretty interesting. There were a lot of people and a lot of drawing and discussions going on. But then I went into this back room that was no windows and it was, uh, I think three designers back there, three architects. And there was just a mess, trace and pencils and markers and models. And specifically, I remember them doing the hotel administration building model at UNLV and um, they had stretched nylon hose or like fabric to make tensile structures in the model. And uh, that for some reason that stuck with me, but. Uh, so prior tour... to that, sorry, sorry to interrupt. So prior to that, you were, you went to school for engineering, aer aeronautical, I guess would be considered aeronautical engineering. Did you finish that program? I mean, you were a full fledged on track to become an engineer. No, I, um, I did an associate's degree in tech illustration and Cessna hired me on as uh, a technical draftsman and then they, they kind of push you through the, through the ranks quickly. But I, see. I learned to fly there, but I did not do an um, aeronautical degree, no. Gotcha, gotcha. So then you had this, ar this architecture office and I interrupted you, you were saying they <laughs> made this model. It was super fascinating. <laughs> well, all the models were super cool, right? It was just like, wow, this is where I want to be back here. There's cigarette smoke and it was just, <laughs> you could see everything happening, right? The people were, were making buildings and it was just an amazing thing to me, kind of like seeing behind the curtain. And so he followed that up with a tour um, and we got to see the building under, under construction and something kind of snapped that day because that, that uh, transition from going to the office and seeing the building being constructed and how it was being constructed and uh, how it was going to fit onto the site and people were going to access it. That really kind of, uh, you know, it, it 
checked a box and I kind of feel like I became an architect that day. And so it was just a matter of going back to school and getting my license. And so I, uh, I finished a bachelor of arts at architecture at university of New Mexico mm. and then followed that up at MIT with a master's. It's amazing. Um, this is a while ago, but why did you end up in New Mexico? You know, uh, at the time when I was there, they had an interesting solar program that was just, there weren't that many, I don't know if you remember back in the, uh, so you don't. <laughs> Probably <there>. not. <laughs> there was a time, children, that everyone didn't think about the sun and uh, uh, didn't pay so much attention as we do now. And so New Mexico had a great program and there were a couple guys there, uh, Robert Walters, who was just an amazing architect. He was uh, from Mexico City and just kind of this great modernist. Uh, and then uh, Anton Predak was there oh. and hung out with him a, a bit and visited a lot of his work. He had a lot of work in New Mexico and Santa Fe. Um, yeah, that was the thing. And then, um, you know, all along the way, uh, just meeting these folks and taking a bit from them about how they see the world and how they approached architecture was uh, super fascinating for me. One of the questions I'd like to ask is, so you had been exposed to architecture or construction at an early age, then you had been exposed to architecture in the, in the office setting and seeing projects kind of being constructed and built, as you mentioned. And sometimes architecture school, though, was very different from what it means to practice as an architect. Was there anything about architecture school uh, for the, the bachelor degree that was surprising or different to you? Uh, specifically, sometimes it's, it's a more of a creative endeavor than people think, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. You know, when you're young and uh, trying to figure it out, there's so much uh, information coming at you. And when you go to school, there's even more. Mm. And the way it's presented is somewhat biased depending on the school or the professor. And so you have to kind of be careful and weed through that. But uh, I think that was the biggest thing was understanding just how complex the world was at the time and and how many um, different ways of approaching architecture there was and really starting to formulate those questions about what's right and wrong mm -hmm. you know how what is the eternal truths what are the eternal truths and how do you get at um, architecture and so i think that was the um the biggest thing about uh, new mexico yeah, that's great. Did you feel like you were um, drawn to architecture because of the technical aspect of it? Or was there something maybe more philosophical about it that interested you? It's just a, um, I, I realized that you're helping worlds into existence, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's kind of this amazing thing. Everyone wants to better their, their world. And so it takes architects to do that really with a lot of support and, you know, um, consultants as far as uh, engineering and uh, so forth. But the initial kind of um, germ or, or seed at the site and how it's going to be done and what's going to be done, that just, that it was a very simple kind of uh, direct thing. It wasn't super technical or anything. It was just like, wow. It, there can be something super meaningful that comes out of the drawing. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. it does. Yeah, it yeah. is that magic when you go from uh, paper to to real life. It is a it is a magical transition. Uh, it's kind sure. of like it's kind of like Christmas every time. Like every time we go to a job site <laughs> yeah. and you see something new, it's like oh my god, you can you can see it coming in real life, and there is like. I don't know, mm -hmm. this anticipation of, you know, working through the drawing and, and the thinking and the planning of making it happen and the day it happens. It's, it's kind of hard to describe. It's, it's, it's a pretty magical thing. It is, isn't it? And the time component uh, makes it even more uh, special because you have to wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not quite like Christmas. It's like a it's little, like it's like you're being like... teased for like two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> Plans at Christmas in the building two years later. Yeah. And sometimes the gift is the wrong one or, you know, it comes damaged. <laughs> right. You know, we, uh, I had one of those moments last week with uh, one of the architects in the office, Josh Kivanyar. Uh, he's a senior uh, 
person in the office and we're doing a house in uh, Pine Flat, which is up above Healdsburg, California. And it's a, a burn house that burned two years ago. And the uh, we reused the foundation and it was a very active kind of uh, butterfly pattern, one of those kit houses. And we, uh, hmm. we dropped a rectangular shed on top of it and let the pieces stick out and use those in certain ways for steps and skylights and so forth. But uh, the point of the story is last week we got to see the steel frame erected for the first time sitting on that that very active concrete foundation that we were reusing and that was one of those moments you know it's kind of the payoff for waiting two years or a year and a half to uh to get to that point and you can see it working in the landscape and the roof kind of parallels the the ground slope and looks away from the west sun so uh Yep, that's the that's the uh, that's the time that keeps us going back to do the next project. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's an odd thing not to to get off path from the story too much, but because so much of the process prior to construction, obviously, is is very it's all in drawing. It's very very abstract, depending on how you look at it, and mm -hmm. um, it's kind of an odd thing for an architect because you occupy that abstract. Um, you know, sort of make believe uh, space, hypothetical space, for quite some time, um, and you have to try and convince people that what's what you're doing makes sense. And sometimes imagery can help convey that to clients, and other times they it's hard to convey it. It's it's a it's a tricky space to be in. Yeah, it's an interesting thing though that you bring up. It's uh, it's great to be in that space. It's as an architect, you almost always have to have. A project underway so you have a place to go <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's a good way to put it um so you are uh you you end up getting a degree did you practice for a bit of time before going back to or before going on to get your master's yes i worked in uh las vegas for um david wells's firm architronics gotcha uh, the test and got my license in nevada and then went back to mit well so why did you go back to graduate school then uh, I didn't know enough. I wanted to know more. I wanted to know, you know, kind of, uh, again, when you're young, there are so many voices and you have to filter and understand what what's right and wrong and how, you know, when you look at an architect's work, you have to kind of look at how the buildings are built and what does that mean. And then you start to look for alignments kind of with yourself and, um, you really start to realize there's just so much to know and uh, so much time is spent on the production of buildings, mm -hmm. uh, the drawings and the the, con the construction period that the concept phase is sometimes leapfrogged or, or gone over too quickly to get on with the business of building the building. And I just found that that's the super critical time and that's the time that's the most uh, important for the rest of the project and so i wanted as much ammo and awareness and mindfulness uh, that i could find and i visited schools but mit had i don't know if you know the school back in the um 60s 70s 80s there was a, a very kind of um it was referred to as built form and it was more European based, you know, that period of time in our lives was kind of um, affected by postmodernism, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I don't believe was always built. It was sometimes drawn and then figured out how to construct. Uh, mm -hmm. That's probably a, a criticism, but um, MIT was more influenced by the Europeans. I took a studio from Gottfried Bohm. Uh, there was Morris Smith was at MIT at the time, and the whole built form kind of direction was basically a language for how to talk about form and architecture. And it's really critical if you're going to build and, and design um, to be able to communicate that to yourself, articulate what you're doing to yourself, and have a description for things so you're not searching for what, what it is that you're building with. So it was super, uh, super interesting. As soon as I saw it, saw the school and all the models and, and the way they went at it. Um, yeah, I was pretty excited to go there. It's interesting. So um, I'm actually not familiar with built form, but it sounds like it was very different from POMO. It's, they're not the same thing like whatsoever. They're almost 
opposites in a certain sense? Very much so. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, I remember uh, the first studio approaching a professor and, um, you know, you just still don't have all the, you know, the rule basis because there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions and they're pretty um, emphatic about them sometimes. <laughs> so <laughs> when you're young, you, you have to find that, that uh, kind of reference data. And so I remember asking a professor, so what is the point? You know, and I drew a diagram of a postmodern building that was kind of Donald Judd-esque with some squares. And, and then I, I drew a sketch of what I was seeing at MIT. And he spun around and in a very kind of loud voice yelled at me and said, the point is not to do embarrassing work. And you have to be aware of what you're doing. And, uh, you know, it turned into a whole a bottle of wine and a, and a discussion. So <laughs> great question. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm guessing if you do a duck that counts as something you might be embarrassed by <laughs> later on i don't know uh, yep <laughs> <clears throat> it's interesting so I, mean, I like the point you bring up though um the broader point of when you're younger trying to be exposed to different kinds of opinions different approaches to architecture design philosophies and then ultimately finding which ones you align with and then at some point carving your own path or having a path that's related to, to something that you 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 feel some synergy with and i think it is a, a difficult thing for students sometimes because it's it's very easy to kind of prematurely latch on to something or someone because uh, not because the the or the work is in alignment with them but because it's 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 you feel more secure that way to be a right. follower in other words i guess yeah it gives you that kind of um formal language to fill in before you have it, mm. before you, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, you I think that's about, totally valid too, yeah. Yeah, you think about what would this person do here and that's really a, a bad trap to get into because you're not listening to the site or to the problem or to the client or what have you. So after you finished school, uh, you continued practicing architecture and then, so t tell us the journey from, from getting your master's degree to then starting your own office. I stayed in Boston for, I think, a year and a half, and I worked for uh, Arrow Street. I don't know if you know those guys, but it was kind of an MIT farm firm. Mm -hmm. So principals had come from MIT, and so there was a shared language there. <clears throat> and they had just finished the Massachusetts Archive Building, which is really one of the most amazing buildings, very uh, contextual made from granite uh, from the site. Um, super modern, but with a lot of direction changes that that uh, kind of relate to the site. But um, then there was the recession of the late 80s and the uh, firms probably dropped 70% of their staff because there was no work. Gosh. Uh, and I had been in the West working for Lear and so um, believe it or not, it took a while for the recession to reach the West. And for some reason, there was um, work in this area around Lake Tahoe still. And it took uh, a little while for it to kind of feel the, the full brunt of the recession. Huh. And so I worked up here for another firm for about five years and then left and started uh, a practice with a partner for five years and then uh, went on my own in 98. Was there always a sense of, um, I was actually, we were just looking up the building you, you described, the, uh, the archive, Massachusetts Archive Building. It's pretty mm -hmm. phenomenal. Was this yeah. around the time when, my, my, my sense of architectural history is, is terrible, by the way. <laughs> was this around the time when um, City Hall was, was being done? No, this would have been after City Hall. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Which I think now they're going to repurpose, no, I think they're tearing it down. Are they really? I think yeah. so. They're tearing it down or they're repurposing it. They're making it into something completely different, uh, which oh, wow. uh, which I get, but I'm also kind of that bummed sucks. about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it's pretty that's iconic. Of that. yeah. my, my question was, um, did you always know that you were going to have your own practice at some point? No, I think it was a, a gradual realization. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure the... Uh, the reasoning, but uh, I do believe that um, probably having less voices around was one of the key things for me hmm. so that I could uh, kind of develop my own. 
was probably the number one reason uh, when I was in a very large office. I remember it being um, just a lot. There's a lot of, just like I said before, there's just uh, a lot of opinions. I remember Peter Zamthor saying uh, the reason he settled in the mountains uh, was that he, he wanted some peace and some quiet and uh, he didn't want to hear the voices until it after he, he'd done the buildings, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a great way to put it, the voices, because uh, you're right when you're in a, a, sometimes even a small office, but certainly a large one where there's a lot of, let's say, middle management or hierarchy. Uh, it's, it's, it's very convoluted, the whole direction of a project sometimes. Um, you, you, there, there's a certain tier of people who are, let's say, producing the work, and they think it's about one thing. Then they tear up, think something different. <laughs> they tear up, think something different. The clients think something different, and there's not great communication across the layers, and it's very uh, frustrating and chaotic. I think at times. That's a great way to uh, characterize it. It's really hard to control that. And in a small firm, um, we only have you know there's like ten of us, and so we all talk daily and we can talk on a moment's notice and we're all like-minded enough that we don't have that sort of uh feeling and in, in the office even though i i tend to generate the beginnings of the work after a lot of site analysis uh from the firm um it's still very open to criticism and um alternate you know suggestions and and directions from from staff and so we're we're very self-critical of the of the work and probably got off on a tangent there. No, no, that's good. I, I want to talk more about the office because you guys do phenomenal work. You do phenomenal work and you're very, very successful. And it's funny in these recordings, one of the questions we ask is like, how big is your office? How many employees? Because a lot of times from the viewer's perspective, we have no idea what's happening behind the black curtain, so to speak. And mm -hmm. I, and uh, But you guys are only 10 people. That's intentional? I, yeah. For the same reason, I just, uh, I had a larger office years ago, maybe 25. And you can't, I don't think one person can manage 25 or at least work with successfully 25 people at once. And so you start having to uh, delegate and or bring in additional help to manage or work with folks and same thing happens. It starts to get um, diluted. It's really difficult to oversee something into greatness or a really high quality level. You really have to be involved in it and get your hands dirty on a daily basis. Yeah, it's a, it's a question I've often thought about, like how do you scale a business and, and a creative practice that is very, very design oriented, design focused, and, and you're trying to create high quality, you know, high crafted things. Um, like, how do you do that when you go from, you know, some offices go from 10 people, they go up to like 60, 80, 200. And uh, it's always perplexed me how they manage to, to do that successfully. And uh, not many do, frankly, but, but the ones that do, it's kind of phenomenal. Well, uh, I think a lot of it is uh, a team's approach. Mm everyone's not working on everything at once. And so there has to be kind of squads within the office, even in our office, we'll have, we'll break a project apart and uh, a two person team might take a portion of it. Uh, like we're doing one in near Ottawa right now, a camp uh, that's a fairly largish project for a firm our size, but uh, we're breaking it into uh, different teams to work on different buildings within the project. So it's not as overwhelming and that that issue kind of is uh, mitigated I, I would kind of assume that at an office of 10 people you guys must be very selective with the work you take on uh we are and really it's selective about the clients because we found uh huh. the clients to be the most important thing and then the project and the site come second and i think for maybe for people who don't have their own office they, that might surprise them because you would think like oh I, we want to go after this size of project this scale of project this type of project whatever and that would maybe be the first thing you would consider and then budget associated with that to some degree um but client is at the top of the list for you guys oh yeah definitely uh you can you can work with a you know a b budget and site uh, with an a client and do something really good and so, yeah, and you're in our office, we're, you know, we're agreeing to work with these 
with these folks for two, three, sometimes five years, depending on the size of the project. So A, you have to you have to kind of get along and like each other and and be like minded about the project and what what you're attempting to do. What are the goals for the project? And so you got to get past those points. And and at um, this point in my career, it's really about having fun because it shows in the work. Mm. And when you have a happy relationship and um, you get to the end of the project, you can really see it kind of in the project and the client's faces. It's really a, a cool thing. Do you have like any, um, I don't know, criteria, like criteria, <laughs> screening questions or, or methods on, you know, knowing if, if you're going to vibe well with those clients? Because sometimes you have like, you know, a face to face meeting for like half an hour. But how do you really know mm. how a client's going to be for, you know, if, if the situation becomes a little bit complicated or if things become stressful or are they really as um bold uh in in what they want as they say they are you know those things really like is there is there a secret <laughs> a test, a a test? test yeah uh no and it's, <laughs> and it's really difficult and i always don't uh, uh do it uh, perfectly well but um we're getting better at it and i think uh the more conversations the better don't mm -hmm. rush into a contract you know have uh, a few face-to-face -face meetings walk the site together um, look at other projects and talk about what you've done in the past and why you did it and um, make sure the goals are similar. Yeah, it's interesting. The The initial, f I guess actually, uh, I guess, I don't know what you call it, pre-contract like part of the project is, is very tricky for architects and also for contractors. Everyone's doing this kind of work to to think way forward you're trying to think like three years in, in advance into the future based on maybe a couple of meetings or maybe a couple of weeks or a couple of months of, of back and forth um, mm -hmm. it's kind of an odd thing um, you had also talked about the importance of concept design as that phase and and sometimes I, th I think your comment applies to the is industry-wide in a certain sense that there's a tendency for people to rush past or rush through concept design. I think that's definitely a tendency from clients, sort of understandably so, because they want to get to the stuff, you know. Um, can you talk about why concept design, that phase is important, and what things take place during that for you guys? Well, the biggest thing is, um, you know, there's kind of this umbrella term called site analysis, but it's really kind of complex in that it has to do with topography and uh, climate and flora and fauna and where the sun is coming up and where the storms come from and what the culture of the place is and uh, the culture of the client and what they're wanting to achieve. And in the project, we just, uh, just are finishing the conceptual phase for um, our camp in near Ottawa. Um, it was about determining where the site was on because it's a large site so you have to find the site um, we had to program it and develop um, the various spaces and adjacencies and the sizes of those spaces uh, and how they might we take it a little bit further than we don't i don't really believe in bubble diagrams i don't know if you've if you know alto sketches but that's kind of our gold standard mm. in our office and it's a you know it's a plan section and elevation all in one one kind of drawing but uh, we start with that. And once all of those constraints and attributes and givens can be kind of graphically articulated, then um, the concept kind of is a result of that. And it's almost like it's almost there, already there. And we're just, oh, this is this and that's that. And it's because of the wind and the roof shape is like this. So you're not so much dreaming things up as you are solving a problem uh, like you would be in designing a tool to fit a certain need. Uh, so it starts off very kind of analytical, but some site visits and uh, a lot of listening when we're on site. Um, but then at the end of that conceptual phase, we have uh, massing diagrams, a program, um, a rough budget, that we can agree on with the client before getting into the main contract and the schematic design. So we're not wasting time designing a building that's not right for the project. Interesting. So there's a lot of things I, I want to cover from that. Um, picking the last point. So you guys actually will 
get through concept design before hitting the main signing the main contract right on this uh project we did um the master planning and conceptual phase hourly hmm. so that we don't have the constraints of uh, a time frame we're just finding out you know what are the questions what mm -hmm. are the what are the options and so then um, when you move to the final contract everyone's comfortable uh, the trust has been earned um, we all kind of have a roadmap of where we're going so the client's more comfortable they don't have a lot of unknowns in front of them mm -hmm. and so then the contract makes a lot more sense because it's relating to that previous conceptual phase yeah it kind of makes sense yeah. right to to feel more comfortable and more free in the research discovery phase because i think there is a lot of like, like, like you're right if this is part of the main contract after everybody's on board there is a lot more pressure in making sure that that discovery phase comes out to something good mm. and i think when you're creative as you know like if you start creation with pressure it's probably not not the right emotion to be designing with so it right. makes complete sense yeah right well when there's a lot to schematic design that that must have assumed something to mm -hmm. get there right mm. and so um you don't want to be wasting schematic design fee searching for the right size building or how many people it's going to see that that needs to be completely done so the designer can just do the designing and not worry about what the question is yeah. that's fascinating um obviously we talked to a lot of architects <laughs> and um it's uh uh, it's maybe something that's not discussed so much, but we find that a lot of architects that we speak to do have a similar thing where they they will have an initial phase. Sometimes it's entire concept design, um, as you described. Other times it's just uh, maybe the first third of concept design, but some kind of initial bit of work that comes before the contract. And there's some some designing happening, even if it's very, very early on <laughs> bubble diagrams or something loose like that. Mm -hmm. um that allows them everyone to get a little bit more on the same page but it, it's a tricky sometimes as i feel like it's really hard to know where do you where to draw the line and where you want that to stop and and it's kind of like the more the more you can do up front the better because as you've described it then once you finish that concept of design like you're everyone is is very comfortable i think mm -hmm. we uh we try to hold back and not go too far, but mm. we extremely do because we can't quite get to all the uh, questions and answers and test the program unless we go a little bit too far. So our conceptual designs, they, they're looking like buildings by the time we present them. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that's also a good point, um, which is a, another aspect, I think, of design in general and architecture that maybe it's difficult for the general public to understand is that in the process it's not a clean one two three four with n nice breaks between them it's kind of like one two three then back to two sometimes back to one and then forward again uh yeah yeah it is not linear for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think our work is really uh it iterative in nature mm -hmm. and uh i i keep a drawing on my desk all the time um we're such a small firm that we can kind of do um we're, we're usually in conceptual or schematic design on a project one at a time so i'm kind of thinking about the project in a singular way and i have a sketch working on my desk and it'll be layered with notes and questions and colored pencils and so forth and so that's the way i keep track of where my mental process of, is on the project is every morning i'm checking that sketch and taking a look at it while i'm doing my other my work trace paper i assume Canary trace only. No, oh, oh, very specific. <laughs> canary. Wait, so is that yellow or white or is that different? Canary well, there's there. there's white and then there's buff and there's yellow and then there's canary, which is like super yellow. Oh wow! And, and so, uh, and I use colored pencils on it, Prismacolor, mm -hmm. um, and I do sort of these hard line drafted sketches, uh, and by coloring um, each and every panel or material. Uh, I worked in Kusong Wu's office uh, back in Cambridge on the Seoul Olympics, and um, we worked together on a drawing where uh, we did that together, and we literally rendered every every demarcation. And so, what you learn from that is uh, you have to understand what it means if you're going to render it in a material. You know, what does that line mean? 
Interesting. Um, and the Canary Trace, that yep. was the point of the story, right? I forgot yeah. your question. <laughs> the Canary Trace has the, the really coolest kind of um, medium for the, the Prismacolor. Because, because the colors pop out more? I guess so. And you know, when you're designing, you have to have confidence. And so uh, making a good drawing builds confidence. Huh. If you can make the drawing uh, start to feel good, like it works, then it gives you confidence the building might work. Are you using, this is getting super specific, but whatever, are you using a slide rule still? I mean, a, a, <laughs> not a slide rule, what do you call it, a main line? Uh, you're in trouble for that one. Uh, yeah, main line. <laughs> yeah, really? Good for you. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, not a slide rule. Um, what do you call it? A, a parallel bar. That's what it is, right? Parallel rule. Yeah. Parallel rule. Slide rule, yeah. parallel rule. Yep. You're just and showing it's actually, off. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, it's a process, right, that requires you to work with your hands different than the keyboard and a mouse. And sometimes that process is good for you just to be working and moving and thinking about the building. And um, I mean, don't get me wrong. We use Revit and 3D modeling and 3D printing in the office. And um, I've got, you know, half of our, our architects are just um, young and gifted uh, with producing those three-dimensional three models after I make a sketch. But, uh, and maybe it's the way I grew up, but when you make a sketch on your board, you can see the whole project at once. It's not a window in, on the screen. And so you can kind of move around mentally and it's just a different way of um looking at the design and i i would i noticed one of your questions talked about students and how they might have different how they might have differed um since you know the last 20 years maybe but um i have um done some jury crits at berkeley hmm. um have some friends that teach there and there is not enough sketching and i think it's uh something that we need to push in the schools and people need to get back to it and force themselves to do it it's a it's a very interesting topic to me uh, partially because uh we're obviously a younger generation but the when we went when the both two of us went to to get our bachelor of architecture the first three years was super heavy on the hand hand sketching hand model making and stuff and then the school slowly started to adopt and enforce like everyone has to have a laptop kind of transition so it was kind of interesting because, you know, going back to rapidographs, like we were forced to use rapidographs on, on um, Mylar during second year, which just seemed outrageous <laughs> at the time. But it was also a lot of fun, I got to say. I mean, frustrating, it's stupid ink pens, but 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 a lot of fun. Um, I forgot what I was going with that. Razor blades oh, and all of that yeah, stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I think you're right. Like <clears throat> sketching by hand or even going further by using a parallel rule and a triangle there's something in layers of trace. I think that's another key thing, like layers of trace allows you to see at a glance on, on one board and one vision, like the history of a project and you can move between the plan view to a quick sketch and perspective and doodles and this and that. And the same flexibility is really hard to replicate in the digital space currently, at least. You're kind mm -hmm. of trapped to whatever mode you're in. You don't have that ability to see history or see, you know, to explore other views quickly that's a great observation i think that every layer of trace you know you can solve three three issues and then you have to go to another layer and and draw it again and the building just gradually gets uh better and gels yeah i wonder if it'll become kind of an uh an, an art form and you know a certain approach <laughs> to architecture that's going to be uh, you know disappearing over time i don't know um <clears throat> So talking about uh, process also, you know, you mentioned a number of times the the heavy importance of sight. And one of the things you said, which I thought was fascinating, is that when you're working through the, the conceptual design and you're reading the site, that it's almost, uh, it's very analytical and problem solving. It's not like you're forcing a random idea or you're coming to the table as the artiste with the, here's my spaceship, let's make it work <laughs> kind of situation. Never. Yeah. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Where does that approach come from for you? Is it, did it come from a particular place you worked at? Did it, does it feel just more natural to you? I don't know. I think it's one of those things again, that's kind of been ingrained over time. Uh, our, our house, you know, growing up, we had uh, oaks. I don't know how many, but a lot of oaks in the 
in the yard and they were very well cared for and it started at a young age of respecting kind of the trees and the place and um visiting family near frankfort kentucky and seeing the horse country and the barns and the rolling hills and the way the farmhouses sat uh and then i guess gradually as i became an architect and i would visit the sites i would be so impacted by the, the beauty and a lot of the sites uh are just you know just in beautiful amazing uh wooded places uh although we just finished one in, in the desert as well but um they're so amazing that you really you, you think that the first goal is how not to change this with your intervention mm. and so we we routinely come to a site with 100 trees and we we really we leave 95 of them and we find that that place where the building belongs and um there's trees within four feet of the buildings i remember seeing one of your houses i forget which one it was um and there's a, a photo there's the photographs are also beautiful but there's a, one image <laughs> there's a big boulder and the house just comes over the boulder and it seemed like the house was designed to fit perfectly around it mm -hmm. just this little spot for this boulder to sit <laughs> and i loved it it's great <laughs> with a big boulder actually it's about the size of a car oh, and wow. uh, oh that site was full of these boulders and the client um when we arrived on site the first day um and he probably wouldn't care his name is uh, dr ho um he said can we you know the only direction he gave me and this is what i was mentioning earlier about the importance of the client mm -hmm. uh, the only direction he gave me that day was can we not harm the boulders and so that really struck me right and uh it wasn't, we wanted to take it further than that. And so that piece of the building that cantilevers over that boulder has uh, a glass floor. And so when you're walking down uh, the access way in that house along that concrete wall, I don't know how well you looked at the, um, or how much you looked at the project, but you can look out and also the site is dropping away from you and you, you basically walk over that boulder. So it's, uh, it's a pretty cool experience. That is very cool. Um, <clears throat> Is most of the work you guys do residential? I mean, it sounds like you do some other things too, but is the majority, is the focus single family? It has been uh, since the big recession, and I'm not sure exactly why, but our firm shrank. And then as we grew out of it, we became, we started to become known for houses. And um, so, yeah, for the last maybe 10 years, um, we've been focused on houses, but um, currently we're working on, as I said, this uh, camp lodge destination uh, resort in Canada, but also we're working on a K through 12 school with uh, Tom Cundy mm -hmm. here in Tahoe. Um, so we're starting to uh, get back into uh, more commercial and hospitality work. So the the kind of um, focus or, or uh, perceived focus on residential came specifically right after or because of 2008, things just happened to go go that direction. Mm hmm. Huh. Yeah, and that house you were talking about with the boulder was the first house after the recession and i think there were three people in the office at the time and uh, wow i drew it basically um myself and so it was a, a great experience about remembering to get back to kind of what i was saying before is getting your hands dirty and not trying to oversee something into fruition wow I, I, th I think it's really interesting that you've maintained a small office size. And one of the challenges with that is that when things like recessions or pandemics or whatever strange stuff takes place, which is more and more frequent these days, um, mm -hmm. it's it's tougher for smaller offices potentially, right? Because you don't have, at least for the people at the top, because they don't have the buffer of 100 people and you can lay off right. a bunch and be okay yourself. <laughs> <laughs> As some offices do, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a sad... Um sad thing but true yeah no we're a very fragile office but that's kind of the um the specialness of it too and and it kind of shows in the work i think because the uh, each one of the projects we're intimately aware of involved in and we stay with until the very end and so and by the way i you mentioned um the i think you mentioned the photography on um mm -hmm. Dr. Ho's house. I noticed you had Joe Fletcher on. <laughs> I listened to his interview, and uh, Joe has shot all of our work. Gotcha. He is he's uh, the best. He's a magical person yeah. and pretty humble about it, too. Uh, super, 
super great guy and i i look forward to every shoot i go to him and we spend a couple days together and have a great time i i think uh I, I think he's very good but also you know the work he's good because i think i feel like a lot of times with the architecture he manages to to take what's good about the architecture inherently and then bring it to the surface and reveal mm -hmm. it in, in a in a in a special way as opposed yeah. to f uh, it, it, sometimes I, I think with photography it, it feels like they're they're trying to force um, a building to look good <laughs> if that makes mm -hmm. sense when yeah. i'm not so sure it does look good uh, or is good um hero images with uh wide angle lenses yep. i hate them there yeah. you go yeah <laughs> yeah super dynamic joe, uh, yeah yeah joe uh joe's thing is natural light and uh, the way he times the light i go back still today from a shoot that he did five or eight years ago and and i'll see a flash of light that i hadn't realized was there before and i'm and i think about the fact that he had to wait for a certain time of the day for that to happen so he's super cool one thing we should definitely oh i want to ask so you, you know you were talking about you being a small office and everyone being kind of intimately involved. So you're involved heavily with the design of pretty much all of the projects, right? It's not mm -hmm. one of the cases where you're kind of just doing all the other things that a business owner has to do, uh, but just doing those things and not doing design. Like you're doing the trace paper, you're doing you're all the way through. Yeah, actually, um, I do it the opposite. I spend all the time on design and as little time as possible on management of the office. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. That's a rare thing. That's pretty cool though. Yeah. Well, if you, if you, uh, you know, it's all in who you hire. If you have good people working and, and you empower them and you're like-minded, uh, we come up a lot of times with the same kind of solutions when we're talking about a problem together. So, um, you don't have to over, over manage or over direct. I don't think, um, if, if there's a strong concept, conceptual phase, like we discussed and a narrative that goes with that and everyone gets on board, it works. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, especially with a studio or an office of this, of your size, I feel, and, and your description of how it operates, I feel like there's a, over time, a building of, um, like shared philosophy that just become the, becomes ingrained in everyone in everyone in the office and allows everyone to function kind of at a higher level maybe really important that that happen <clears throat> no one person can do this work uh if you look at our work i mean each one of those projects you know a lot of decisions a lot of work yeah and and to be honest that's one reason why i, I was um surprised at the, the 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 size of the office because the projects you do are super complicated and they're not necessarily small, um, and th and that's just just translates as you said. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of decisions to be made, mm -hmm. you know, for a handful of people. Really, it's uh, you know, um, every day iterations. You can't you can't make them all at once, and it continues right through construction yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. We consider the construction phase, like the shop drawing phase, especially, as a final check on the design. So we check the windows or the casework or the um, this and that for opportunities to make it better. One of the things that's happened, I maybe it was always the case, but I feel like it's become a more recently a common situation is for architects uh, to become less involved during construction, if at all, and, mm -hmm. and architects performing um, either no CA or they perform construction administration in a very watered down kind of sense where they just kind of answer the phone if something comes up mm -hmm. um i'm gonna guess that that's not the case for you guys <laughs> no yeah yeah you can't really do it that way uh someone has to make that decision and it's just a matter of who whether the the person who authored the design can make the decision with the client or someone on the building team is making it or someone on the development team is making it but uh obviously the person that has the best uh uh bank of knowledge to make uh, decisions and it's not always about spending more money or making the design better uh, more flashy or more iconic a lot of times it's about making it less expensive and doing it more efficiently and more expediently and you can uncover those things during construction because it slows down a little bit for you in the beginning like you were saying a million decisions and a uh, hundred sheets of drawings that's um that's a lot to look at every day 
But once you get into construction and then you start focusing on, say, the steel frame and you become the advocate of the steel for that week and you really kind of pour through it. And, and I know we have guys in the office architects that are really super good about chasing that detailing around that steel frame and making sure that it fits with the architecture. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point that that you know someone will make that decision, whether it be the architect, and, and it's a group effort. But I mean, it, without the architect, then most of the time it's the builder who makes the decision. Which, um, you know, for high, uh, what you could describe as high level design, that that doesn't. It, it, it in the end, you have weird conditions. Everyone sees it. Like, why did that happen? Well, because you didn't have an architect there to <laughs> to, yeah. to think back through, you know, the history of the project and that database, kind of you were talking about. Yeah, just one of those in a in a photograph afterwards and you're you're cringing yeah, <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> it haunts you forever they, they sneak through sometimes yeah, um, that's great. <laughs> um we should definitely talk about the yeah what yeah okay <laughs> the analog house which is the house i think you're currently sitting in the house that's in in Truckee. Mm -hmm. um and it it's your it's your house but you uh collaborate with or had uh uh but uh, Olsen Kundig be the architect or co-architect or however you describe it of it. And I think mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Can, can you tell us about how that came around and, and why you decided to, I don't know, not just do your own house? Sure. Um, there's a lot of uh, reasons, uh, but I do remember a professor telling me uh, at school to never do your own house. <laughs> It's, it's uh, you know, a thousand years of torment after it's finished because you keep growing and changing and you're living inside your head from that time period. But uh, I had done a few houses with my wife and our, our firm is very busy and um, just throwing my personal house into the mix uh, with the lowest priority in the office because the client's houses are going to come first. It's not a great way to do a good house. And you know, our staff gets paid the same, Tom's and mine. So most architects pay, you know, uh, um, similar wages to, uh, you know, the architects in the office. And so we, Lisa and I, my wife, had found uh, common, common ground in Tom's work. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about eternal truths that I heard when uh, all the way as far back as MIT. Um, I heard Tom speak uh, at a lecture in Reno and we sp we kind of hung out after the talk and uh the more i uh kind of read about his work and watched some some lectures i saw that he knew the same things that that i did and he knew a lot of these sort of eternal truths that are ignored by a lot of the work today and it just has to do with spatial connections and you know knowing about scarpa right and uh how how his work um, effect, should affect you know generations of architects um, because everything was separate separated by space right it's kind of the most important thing mm -hmm. in light but um, it just turned into wow that would be fun why don't we do that why wouldn't we do that and and also for me as an architect it turned into this um, experience of being a client <laughs> and finding out what it's like to be on the other end of it and what kind of questions you have and, you know, um, the expectation levels and just, a it's a great lesson. And, uh, for any architect is, you know, finding out what the client feels, uh, when you're, when you're providing the service. So yeah, were ahead. you an easy client on this project? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we started out, um, tough, but then, uh, Tom says we're the easiest client he's ever had by yeah. the end. I think, but, I get, well, it's funny. I mean, <clears throat> there, there's kind of a, a running, I don't know if it's a joke, but but talk amongst architects of like the clients you want to avoid. And of course, these are just, just generalizations, but it's it's mm -hmm. lawyers is always at the top of the list. The other one we hear frequently is, is doctors, interestingly, and of mm -hmm. course, ar other architects. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, uh, I think he, um, you know, we have mutual friends and I remember one of my friends, John Grable, down in San Antonio, telling me, uh, yeah, um, I talked to Tom, and, and I think he's going to do it. He's going to work with you. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. Like, I didn't I didn't really think it was a question, but um, evidently it was. And so maybe it was, uh, you know, um, not an easy path for them as well. I never 
uh, I didn't think about it so much from his perspective, but uh, it turned out to be great. And, and really we um, became great friends and it was, it was, uh, it was always sort of a, um, a, an exchange of ideas, like a team. Yeah. Uh, super easy. And they didn't have to kind of over present or overdraw. We got it. You know, they would send us uh, drawings and they, they did all of the construction documents. And so uh, that was fun. Just um, working with their office and their uh, detailing is just beautiful. I should frame some of the drawings. I mean, just really amazing. Yeah. I think you had said the first time you had seen him in person was at that lecture in Reno. Uh, was that like a long time ago or just before this started or? That was just before the start, but, um, I had seen him, uh, in San Francisco at the AIA convention or something. Oh, like sure. That. Sure. Okay. But never personally. So we kind of just, um, chatted up after the, after the lecture. And then, uh, I think I rang him up the following week. That's really and cool because one would kind of assume that, okay, if two architects at, at your guys' level are going to, one's going to do a house for the other and there's going to be a little bit of, you know, collaboration. It's not strictly just design whatever and I'll see you at the end. That you would be somehow be, you know, friends of like 25, close friends of 25 years or something. But obviously you knew each other, but that wasn't necessarily the case. No, I think there was just, um, you know, if you listen to someone in a, in a lecture or a talk and you really pay attention, you can kind of get a pretty good idea of what they're about mm -hmm. and what it would be like to spend time with them. And I think that's kind of the most critical thing and to see if you're on the same page. And that's kind of what it was. And we both had this sort of um, industrial aesthetic uh, vocabulary that was easy for us. I grew up in Gary and going to the steel mills and, and actually seeing that vocabulary firsthand. And so it was super comfortable for me. And, and he's a very unpretentious guy. And so it didn't feel like, uh, we were going to be put in one of those situations where some architects going, uh, I don't think so. It should be this, you know, it was, it was not this sort of, uh, uh, secretive, um, process. It was super open. And how do we solve this problem? So, uh, w w one of the things I'm curious about is in the, I guess throughout the entire process, but more specifically the design phases, um, was, was it like a, a co-designing experience or was it really, um, you know, Tom Kundig in his office doing the work and then you acting just as a normal client and giving f feedback, maybe a little bit more, you know, specific feedback or, or, or wise feedback, but, but like, was it, was, were there actually sessions where you guys were co-designing? There was, but um, the way it really worked was Tom did a few sketches and I really wanted to back away and, and you know, work on my projects at the office. And I wanted to see what, <laughs> what it would be like to just be the client. Mm. Uh, but you know how that is when you know the, you're an architect and you know the site super well and you can't help yourself but say, well, actually, <laughs> what if you did this? And so... Um, we actually exchanged sketches and, uh, I sort of, I think this sketch, um, or this plan, um, was a generation of a formal vocabulary, a plan diagram, a field, uh, organization in the woods, in the trees mm -hmm. that had been kind of brewing in my mind since the MIT days. And it had to do with kind of movement and stopping places and going places and, building a concrete ground form and then fitting it with a framework and fitting between the trees. And so uh, ultimately I did a sketch and sent it to Tom. And I think there was, there was a period of, of quiet. Any <laughs> <laughs> other architect might have said, what the F? <laughs> Who is this guy? But after, I don't know, uh, a month or two, I heard that it was in the, uh, you know, Olsen Kundig has the uh, Thursday Night Crits, which are super cool, where they review all their projects. And I I heard it was reviewed, and uh, <laughs> and however it was decided, uh, they decided to move forward with it, and that it was it was on to the races then, and they kind of took the lead with design development. And, and then I be, kind of became, I wouldn't say a normal client, but uh, informed normal right. client. Right, informed, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we would, we would exchange ideas. And because I was here, 
I could sketch over something and say, if you do this, like we raised the ceiling of the living room and I'd say, you'll get this West sun. And so we were kind of their eyes and ears to some extent, architectural eyes and ears and kind of giving them attributes and consequences. And, and then we did quite a bit of the construction phase. Mm. Uh, Steve Grimm, who's a partner now at that firm, super talented architect, um, kind of marshaled all the drawings. He supported us during the construction phase, but uh, I had a, a friendly who had built with my, built uh, several projects for me, uh, Andreas Rickenbach. And so um, we kind of took the lead in the construction phase. So it was kind of a back and forth uh, all the way through. It's such a, an, an interesting, beautiful idea that you would hire another designer as a designer to, you know, design your house. And I think it, it makes a lot of sense. And, and, and I think maybe the thing to extract from that is just the honesty of being like, I do not want to have that in my office because it's not going to be the best. And, and, and because I think you're right, like, you know, like what, what someone told you that you would live in your head, like forever after you design your own house, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> we don't have a house that we've designed for ourselves yet, but I think about it once in a while because hopefully, you know, one day it, it, we will have the opportunity to do that. And I'm always, I, I would be the worst client. I know, you know, all of the <laughs> options out there. I would what? know all of the possibilities. I would never be able to make a decision. <laughs> You're on record. <laughs> you know, That's like, it. You've sealed your fate. So I think, and I think in, in I mean, <laughs> On paper too, I think it's it's beautiful to be able to support someone else's that you admire their work or you feel a special connection and and um, I wish that would happen more often. Honestly, you know. I believe all of that. I think it's a you know. You owe it to the profession that you're in. To, I mean, you wouldn't go to you wouldn't uh, perform your own medical uh, procedure, right? I mean, oh, you God, would... no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it and it. Uh, the biggest thing is it just turned into be, you know how many times you don't know the full ramifications of a decision, mm -hmm. but it turned into be a super fun thing. Lots of trips to Seattle. Um, we visited a lot of Olson Kundig projects, which was fun. And then just, you know, having a relationship with Tom in his office now kind of forever. And we'll probably do work together uh, for years. Uh, and we can pick up the phone or, or write an email. And, you know, that aspect of it, the kind of... Uh, personal friendship aspect of it. Uh, I didn't expect it to be as, as potent as it is. It's mm. very fun. And you had mentioned that you had designed, I, I think you had mentioned designed a couple houses in the past for yourself. Was that right? Mm hmm Did one in Lafayette uh, in the East Bay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then one here in Tahoe years and years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. do you think, I'm trying to think of my, what my question is. It, it's sort of like, do you think that you could have only had another architect be the architect of one of your houses at this point in your career as opposed to earlier on? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Probably. Yeah, I think uh, as you, as you uh, mature, you realize that uh, there's other things in the world, other uh, opinions, other forces, and you don't necessarily, you know, your confidence level grows in one way, but then you're humbled as well as you, as you mature and you realize the world. One of the things you had mentioned too, is these kind of eternal truths. And you talked about it a little bit, but I'm sure people listening and watching are like, okay, but what are, <laughs> what, are the, <laughs> what else is on that list of the eternal truths? I mean, is it a specific, um, do you have specific ones in mind? I mean, you had mentioned, Scarpa, you had mentioned space being, I forget how you phrase it, space being the, the uh, I forget what you said actually, space being between uh, other spaces or defining space? No, well, um, you know, there's all kinds of um, scale sp um, with space. So space should be continuous in the house and it's not a subdivisional plan, but it's, it's fluid like a liquid. But then also when you assem assemble materials, walls or beams or floors and ceilings um they don't have to be shoved together and and uh they can be spatially uh related or separated by space in other words mm. and so and that does good things for you a lot of times things aren't straight in construction and so leaving a space allows it to be more assembled and not you're not trying to fit these pieces together that aren't you know when you're pouring a concrete wall like this you know, the tolerances 
uh, eighth inch, quarter inch, uh, that's too much to, to lay a piece of wood next to, right? Mm. And so like here, the wood floor is separated from the concrete with space, and there's a piece of cork that separate, um, fills that space. Uh, but, you know, there's, uh, there's probably, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, I mean, I threw that term out there, eternal truths, but I guess I call them um, vocabulary terms, and they're describing uh, form and material um, and how it, it might be assembled. But for instance, a building should have a ground form. So if you look at a lot of our work, there is a concrete form that makes the house meet the ground. And the foundation is just not this uh, element that comes eight inches above the grade and stops, and then someone builds a wood house on top. The, the concrete foundation can be the ground form of the building. It can, it can grow up through uh, the building and become and demark um, spaces. Mm. And so most of the concrete, and like this one here, this is insulated concrete double eight inch walls so it's um you get what you see on the exterior you get it on the interior but there's insulation in the middle and you get a ton of mass um so as you move up from the building and you go up through it there's you know there's just um attributes to form that we should all be aware of and it's not just drawing this sort of cartoon on a, on that piece of trace sorry <laughs> so sorry it's tom coonden <laughs> calling <laughs> get out of here trying to do an interview my, tom <laughs> comment on my review um you know and how this how the building meets the sky uh if you look at our work there's a lot of thin edges so that that line is delicate and there's not a lot of friction with the way it meets the sky or the landscape and it makes the house or the form lighter. Mm. And so between the ground form and that thin, how you meet the sky, there's a ton of decisions of how you, how you build that closure. The structure can be separate from the closure. It doesn't have to be built into the glazed walls or into the framed walls. And so the structure can be read and you understand how the, the building is uh, held up. Um, spatial uh, structure is always better than hiding it and concealing it. Um, you know, we could have a whole nother podcast on this subject of kind of describing the attributes of what we call built form. But, uh, you know, it's just a, a way of uh, describing things and understanding that like concrete is a continuous surface material and it doesn't behave the same way a wood frame wall does. And so you shouldn't treat it the same way. Mm -hmm. it's that understanding of materiality that, uh, that we're talking about, I think. It's interesting the way you describe um, all of those things. You know, going back uh, to the, you kind of described the space which just can, can be understood as water <clears throat> and it's contiguous in a certain sense, right? And you just morph it in certain ways to, to create definitions between things or of of rooms or of spaces and I, I i like that point because that's one of the things i think especially in the residential probably maybe all building types of residential single family residential that's one of the differences let's say between a, a really good architect um, and how they view and approach a house versus maybe what clients or real estate agents or others think of a house which is boxes and boxes and boxes i want this number of boxes of this different types and i want them you know to be next to each other and whatever and it's like, okay well you're making a hotel that's not really what we're trying to do here is have a bunch of enclosed boxes next to each other right i was wondering the the lang the architectural language in which your office um you know um, design project is very modern but in a very purest way of the elements i would say if that makes sense um is that but you come from you know like you said like the midwest and maybe i don't, I don't want to say like more traditional but maybe more rural environment and and it's funny because it reminds me where i come from i also grew up in a small town in the countryside you know not traditional but very rural houses and you know french houses and all of that good stuff and there is a certain emotion for me attached to these types of buildings but mm -hmm. in what I found more pleasure and comfort in terms of design is the complete opposite. Um, and I was wondering for you if, you know, the more modern 
um, architecture, how did that come about? Is that mm. Was that a reaction to where you came from? Was it a trip you did somewhere and you realized there is another way to think about architecture and buildings? Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that developed over time? Uh, I think it developed over time, but, uh, and I, I hope I answer your question correctly. I'm not sure exactly what um, what you're asking, but um, I think the the thing is, and it goes back to this whole discussion of space as a liquid, if you're designing the space first, then you're not designing an object to be looked at. It's it's uh, it's an uh, experiential decision making process, hmm. and and you're deciding what makes a good house, where the sun is, where the wind is, where the views are, how you move through it, um, how you relate to the rest of the family members if you're doing a house. Um, you know what are the uh, the connectivity pieces. Uh, in the house that make things work. And so once you do that, then suddenly you're not designing an A style. And mm -hmm. if you call modernism a style, then now you're not doing that. You're designing space. And then you're, you're fitting it into those things I was talking about. There has to be a ground form. So the foundation has to come up and that, that, that foundation is oriented, you know, based on the, the site and the slope and so forth. And so the, the tools to enclose the space or demark the space become simpler when uh, they're more rectilinear. And so when you think about modernism, it's, it's super flat planes uh, assembled loosely, hopefully, and with space between. But it's so much easier to uh, articulate a space if you uh, are not trying to kind of design this um, sort of iconic form that you've dreamt up mm -hmm. and you're just responding to a place. And if you make uh, reasonable decisions along the way, it'll be good uh, aesthetically in the way, the way it feels. Yeah. Uh, if you have a narrative um, for how you're making the decisions for the form and the materials, you don't have to worry so much about what it looks like, I don't think. That's very interesting. Yeah, I like the description of it. Um, it's it's one of these things that I think it's it's we're always trying to uh, uh, trying to find ways. I think architects in general are trying to find ways to articulate these things to people who haven't gone through architecture school, who haven't practiced as architects. And I like mm -hmm. the way you described it a lot. It's almost you're 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 designing from the opposite end than what a lot of people would assume. I think most people would assume non architects would assume. Okay, you're going to design a building. Draw me the walls. Show me the colors of what it's going to be and the molding or whatever, like show me the forms, right? But mm -hmm. you're saying it's the opposite. We figure out the space and then the elements, they simply exist to define the space that you've, you've, you're you've trying to, to give, give presence to. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're trying to find them and, and not necessarily generate them. Mm -hmm. You know, if you talk to a good songwriter, they'll talk about finding the song and it's not so much or capturing the song or a writer uh it's not so much that you're just sitting there grinding away and forcing it to happen and so it's a it's a delicate dance yeah finding it's almost like a reverse engineering right like you you kind of try to think about the experience like the living experience first and mm -hmm. then go backwards on how the space should come about um and, it, and it kind of, as you're saying, like then if you when you approach it that way, what you have in the end is just simply what it needs and should be, um, and it's very clean, I guess. Yeah, and it's also a great way to bring a client through a process. Hmm. Um, we literally do not generate what it looked like, what it looks like drawings, like elevations or three D drawings early, too early in the process. We talk about the site and diagrams and direction. And like I was telling you, those sort of adjacency diagrams for where the spaces belong, where they should be. And we don't, and so you get that sort of buy-in along the way and we're designing the building together with the clients. So by the time you get to what it feels like, I don't even like that term, what it looks like, but what it, what its presentation is, yeah, um, they've been with you all the way along and they understand why it is that way. And it's not something you have to dream up a, a defense for 
it makes sense to them. So you had also mentioned with that kind of di diagrammatic work, you mentioned something called Alto, Alto drawings. Oh, talking about Alvar Alto, yep, the architect. And it's a, and it's a mixture of uh, yeah, um, and it's a mixture of plans Just, uh, and. If you look at his sketches, when he would uh, envision a building, the, you can see from his sketches, the building is already there in his mind and he's just illustrating it for himself. And he draws a plan uh, and it's not precise. There might be four strokes on a line to demark a line before he decides what it is. But then right below it, there's a section that aligns with that plan and, and maybe an elevation or, or some kind of sketch or a detail. But, uh, I was just saying that of the of the architect sketches that I've uh, <laughs> he he impressed me years ago, and I've never I've never uh, found anything more potent than his sketches. I mean, and there's a lot of guys. Sharon, um, uh, I'd run through the list of those those types of uh, spatial guys, but yeah, it was just a reference to his sketching ability and and the way he, he envisioned buildings. Yeah, gotcha. Instead of, I think you had said, instead of just staying strictly in bubble diagram uh, form or something. Well, yeah, but also just architects tend to fall in love with the plan. Yeah. If you're not careful. And so you, you, you know, those layers we talked about with the trace, you, you, if you're not careful, you'll end up with 20 layers of plan drawing and you haven't investigated what happens in the section. <laughs> and so you have to force yourself to do that right away or else you don't know what the plan is doing. Yep. I think also the the way you take a client through the project is is an interesting topic, and um, there is it is it ever challenging to have maybe clients? And I know a lot of your clients are repeat clients, but but new ones who have not gone through a design and building process. To most often, what we see is like to, to get them to slow down a little bit at, at mm -hmm. the beginning, or for them to understand what's about to happen, because it's a, the, you know, going from concept designer, the initial bidding through CDs is a long process in terms of time, but a lot of stuff happens and it's difficult for people to, to understand that. I mean, I mean, I, I understand why it would be difficult for them to get it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, well, especially um, because sometimes they come with preconceived, you know, this is a big thing to them. They've been thinking about it for years and um, you know, to to decide to build, you have to be an optimist. And so it's a very kind of uh, bold act for a client to make that decision. And so they don't take it lightly and they, they do their research and many times talk about, um, you know, a reference file of images or whatever. And we ask the clients to hold on to those until we have gone through the conceptual phase. And if they still want to talk about them and some of the the reasons why they chose an image, then we're willing to do that. Hmm. Um, but that's one way we we do uh, control the pace hmm. because you're right, everyone wants to get to what is it? What is it that we're going to do? And it, you know, it's a slow cooking process. Um, you have to take the time to allow yourself and the people on the team and the client to absorb all of the factors that shape the architecture. You'd also mentioned different types of projects that you guys are currently doing. And one of them I read online, the K, uh, K through 12 project, the school is also with, uh, Tom Kundig, which is pretty cool. So a client or the client for that project, uh, saw our house here and rang me up and talked to me about it and asked if we would be willing to work together on the school. And so, they had already started the master planning process, um, but they they hired us to kind of um, tweak the master plan and start working on the buildings. And so, to date, we've we're into design development on. Uh, uh -huh. We don't call it's a it's an interesting kind of school, and it's um, it's got a number of different ways of describing it. Basically, it's planned adversity, so really challenging kids, hmm. and not making it so easy for them where they're dropped off in a classroom and picked up at three. Um, a lot of outdoor um, teaching um, exercises. They they wanted the school to be very open and embracing of the landscape, and so um, the classrooms literally, as you might expect, uh, if Tom and I are working on a project together, they completely open up, and a portion of the classroom is outside under a roof, and much of the um, 
student's day is spent outside. It's on the project is on acreage here in uh, Truckee. And those are just the first two buildings, but we also have a cafe that we've designed and um, it involves, uh, again, the children cook for themselves and there'll be a, a, a station there where they learn. Uh, but again, it, it opens up to a big terrace and looks out to the Martis Valley. But there's a series of buildings and it's gonna be probably a 10 year project and we're just getting started. Wow. It's, uh, yeah, it's super exciting. Wow. Uh, designed, uh, pre-manufactured by Spearhead. And I don't know if you know those guys, but they do super high quality kind of uh, pre-manufacture. So the steel frame comes out uh, all ready to go and, you know, sistered up with the, uh, the members that they need the wood members and it's almost like an erector set um the semis show up in order of um how the building is going to rise um and then also using clts on this project cross laminated mm -hmm. timbers mm -hmm. i don't know if you know, know about those but uh a way to sequester carbon by pulling trees out of the forest mm -hmm. dead standing trees i think is it challenging to move between project types because uh, doing a single family home and the kinds that you do, which are very custom and a lot of detail, expensive, is it is it weird or challenging to go from that kind of space and then scale up to other things that's a master plan level or do structures that are larger, structures that are different program, probably have different budgetary uh, constraints or possibilities? <laughs> Well, it's obviously something you have to pay attention to, but it's it's really uh, a nice break. Mm. A, house, a house is very emotional and personal, and a larger project, there's more of a team approach on the client side, and so there's there's maybe a little less overthinking, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, we welcome it. We love uh, we love doing projects of different scales and sizes, and they inform each other. So many times, the vocabulary or the materiality might be very similar uh but it's you know obviously built on a larger scale which which house that you've done you think was the most challenging to do for whatever reason we've completed two largish concrete houses uh just in the past few months and those were probably the most challenging so it's a similar technology as here but uh, they were a little larger a lot larger <laughs> and multiple stories one was on Lake Tahoe with a very high water table with mm -hmm. an underground garage. And so um, you'll be seeing those published in the next year or so. Probably Joe Fletcher will be out to shoot them. Um, but we have, it's a good question because we have made a concerted effort to be careful of that and mm -hmm. be careful of the size and complexity of projects and houses. So, how, so just for some reference, how large are these houses that you're describing? That's in square footage, like, let's say. Uh, well, 10, 12,000 feet. Okay. Yeah. It's large for us. That's not a, it's not a giant house, but it's, it's a super large house for most people. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, of course. Yeah. yeah. It's large in particular when you're, when, when I obviously haven't seen them, but we know your work. So it, it's large if you consider the kind of architecture that's going into it, you know, um, there yeah. are plenty of giant houses that are constructed everywhere, um, but they're you know, super basic, just white chip. Well, and if big you deal volumes. with wood sticks, it's not the same thing as concrete, too. So, <laughs> That's true, too. You know? That's true. Wait, so what made those houses um, um, challenging? Was it just because of the scale, or was it because of the 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 concrete, or was it the site? I think it was the scale, probably. Um, the one here in Lake Tahoe was a very small site, and we have a uh, a very strict federal agency that controls the water quality of Lake Tahoe. Oh. So the buildings have to be basically very precision uh, designed and almost dropped in by helicopter so as not to disturb the sites and cause runoff on into the lake. Wow. And this client um, asked for everything that <laughs> would fit within the, within the uh, envelope of the site and it has an underground um, basement that is only about 12 inches above high water table. And so squeezing between all of the TRPA requirements and the, you know, the challenges and the desires of the client and then doing something, uh, something that's, uh, not oversized, even though it's 12,000 feet, half of it is below grade. Wow. And we do that. We do that, uh, whenever we can. The one in Las Vegas is 10,000 feet. And, 
uh, about 40% of that house is below grade. And wow. so it does not feel, uh, feel like a super big house. Right. Like a big monstrosity <laughs> occupying <laughs> a natural landscape. <clears throat> yeah. We try not to do those. Is, is there a type of project that you have not done yet or or one that you were very interested in trying to do, um, aside from the, having an ideal client, I mean, the project type itself. Well, we're, um, we're moving our office from Berkeley to San Francisco mm. right now. I'm working out of, uh, uh, my condo there because all of our, um, San Francisco, North Bay, South Bay people are remote. And so there's, um, uh, there was no point to keeping the office. We had an office in Berkeley for 10 years, 12 years. Mm. Uh, and so we're starting to move uh, towards getting a small office in the city. And uh, I would really like to, it would, um, if we could do a multifamily project with mm. mixed use component, that would be my, uh, probably my go-to project right now, something in the city, but that would, uh, you know, bring more joy to more people instead of the single family project. Multifamily housing is definitely the thing in San Francisco. Uh, it's, I guess the city needs it, and those kind of developments are happening everywhere. There's not a lot of, and across, not just in San Francisco, but more the comment on all of California, there's not mm. a lot of good ones, I would say. <laughs> there's yeah. like, uh, like actually, we had a long time ago on now, an architect, who'd, they do a lot of multifamily work, and we were joking that there's, if you look at, if you open up whatever, Arc Daily or something, and you look at, uh, you know, 20 different multifamily housing projects, you can categorically see very clearly there's like four different types of design approaches to multifamily houses. There's ones with like big frames. You have like the squiggly thing that goes around the facade. It's like very clear. There's like four types and a lot of them are not done very well. So it would be great to have your office work on some of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, we would love that. It's uh it's, it's long been a goal of mine. So we're, we're going to start, um, focusing on it more, I think. Is it, uh, I mean, I guess it hasn't happened yet, but is it going to be like a really difficult thing to try and, uh, I guess, get into that portion of the market? Oh, I'm sure. But uh, the way these kind things kind of happen are, is that someone will see a project that we've done that might not be completely related to their project, but they see a way forward from that project. Mm. So um, I think our, our camp out house, um, was one of the um, reference projects that our client in Canada saw and and thought mm, I can use that uh, architect that you know that project translates to our project even though it's bigger. Sometimes I think also if if you don't necessarily design those types of building like you might be bringing something more special to working let's say on those single family buildings than someone who only does that. Um, mm -hmm. You know I feel like. Maybe because the interest is newer on those types of structures versus that's if that's something that you do every day, the excitement maybe has died down over time. I don't know, but um, I would, I would, if I was a client, I would definitely hire maybe someone who doesn't do those more, things to make yeah. it maybe more challenging, more interesting, just make you know, push things forward. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, like. that's a special. I mean, that the, you bring a good point. That there's kind of a, a little bit of um, not self selection, but like the the the. You have to be a certain kind of client to want to do that, right? And yeah. if they're going to do it, then they are that kind of client. It's uh, There's obviously a lot of pressure on the f uh, economics of a project like that. Yeah. And so you have have to be super clever about um, picking your battles and how to build something reasonable uh, because you can't really scale up the quality of detailing and construction you might do on a house. Yeah to a large building it just would be too expensive in today's uh especially in today's environment with all that we're, that's going on and so it's you know it's all about uh and you're right um every project uh if it's different like that your your excitement level is increased and your kind of skill level probably uh raises and so um managing that kind of project and making sure i mean uh i think we all laughed when you said challenging we got to make sure it's not too challenging so to get built. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um what is the most challenging part of your job you would say and this is not specifically about the conversation we just had this is just a general question um just that oh. getting it <laughs> construction the budget 
managing the construction so that the important things are are maintained and you keep that concept sacred and carry it through there's a lot of pressures during construction to to alter the design and make it less expensive or um, faster and so you have to strike a balance between when that's appropriate and when it's not mm. and so it's a constant challenge and especially when you know lumber um, increased threefold <laughs> last year and then came back down you know that's a <laughs> that's a challenging uh, um, fact to have in the uh, economics of a project and yeah. so and that's happening with all the materials steel is up concrete's up and so our projects that were already um, what you might say expensive now in the in this market you have to work extra hard to keep them in check what's something you do to relax and to to i guess recharge even well diff obviously everyone has different levels of um kind of extra stuff that you do but um travel is a great one obviously we haven't done a lot in the last two years because of the uh, pandemic but um some of my most uh especially when you're designing a project uh but we we traveled to greece and tanzania just before the lockdown and those were those were really potent trips as far as uh energizing energizing the next project right mm -hmm. so travel is great um but really what that means is observation and is kind of what i do mm -hmm. to relax and i think uh, sometimes it drives my wife nuts because I see everything and <laughs> comment on everything and, and many times it's not quite right and I need to I need to comment on it uh, so I mean that's what we are right trained observers and then those observations hopefully go into the work if you're curious and you can learn a lot that's great I'm, I'm gonna guess your wife is not an architect she is not but she could have been she uh <laughs> she did the interiors here and um She's been with with me now for I think 16, 17 years, and so she's seen the work. And uh, many times she can answer the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Come in, I'm impressive. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my last question would be: Do you have a favorite building? And I, I hate <laughs> yeah, that yeah, question. You have to because... rephrase the question because we, if you listen to Joe's interview, we asked him. The question usually is, what is your favorite building? And we made the mistake of asking Joe, do you have a favorite building? And if so, what it is? And he said, well, no, I don't. And that was his answer. <laughs> so let me rephrase it. The question is, what is your favorite building? <laughs> or two. Uh, well, yeah, I don't have a favorite, but I have to say I've been in tears a few times. Uh, the Sagrada Familia. Oh, oh wow. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? And then almost every Scarpa project, but especially the Brown Tomb. Therm Val's really mm -hmm. moving project. Uh, I met Peter uh, Zumthor about six years ago when I stayed there. And he's got cabins there in Val's in Lease. And he was staying next door and he had done these cabins and they were, uh, uh, I don't know if you know them, but you should go check them out. And in the summer, they're cheaper, by the way, and then in the winter. <laughs> uh, but super kind of quiet and clean and pure. And it's really, if you go there as an architect, it takes you a day or so and you start realizing what's not there, what's missing. That's so cool and so quiet. Uh, but I could probably go on. There's dozens of favorite buildings out there. That's a great description of, of a place to, to be there for a day and then to realize what's not there uh, is what makes it. The Sagrada, I haven't seen any of those last few projects you mentioned, but the Sagrada Familia I have seen, it is crazy. It is crazy. And they're planning to build the final you know, it's, uh, it's been going on for spire, quite some time. Uh, it'll yeah. be another 20. Yeah. I don't know how they're going to do it. Uh, it'll take some time to complete. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it in about seven or eight years. I have to go back. I mean, this final, the, the final uh, uh, tower is like really, really tall. You see it in person and, and it's like, well, this thing is huge. And you realize it's not even done. It's going to be another third taller. It's yeah. insane. Wild man architect. To have someone, to have that project going, you know, how many years after his death? And be what it is. It's just, I mean, amazing, right? It's incredible that they would just keep trying to finish it. Like at I'm some glad, point, though. no one was like, you know what? This just doesn't make sense. It's <laughs> taking too long. Let's just shut it down. No, like the, the, the vision is being carried like forward and, and, and it's incredible. 
super incredible. No, I'm happy because I feel like more often I read in the news of, of hist- what I mean, for architects at least, you know, historic buildings, important buildings are either demolished or they're turned into something else. So if they're mm-hmm. bothering to keep something and then complete it, that's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. let's do more of that. Greg, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come on the show and answer our questions. This was a delight. Well, good. Thanks. I hope it, uh, I hope it worked for you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on YouTube. If you like what we're doing, then please support our show by hitting that subscribe button and liking and commenting on our videos. You can also find us on most of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're mostly on Instagram. And you can reach out to the hotline, 213-222-6950. You can send a text message or leave a voicemail if you have any reaction to this recording, any questions you might have or guest suggestion, feel free to send it our way. Cool. Thank you for watching and see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.